and turn uh, with our Sunday school kids here. Uh, we're going to sing a couple uh, children's songs, number 635, 635, Jesus bids us shine with a clear blue light, a pure light, a blue light, like, like a little candle burning in the night. In this world of darkness, we must shine, you in your small corner and I in mine, number 635. Jesus bids us shine with a clear blue, <laughs> like a little in the night, in this world of darkness, we must shine, you and your small and I and mine, Jesus bids us shine first of all. to number 639. <clears throat> this is the one that all the Sunday school kids should know. The books of the Bible. Um, we got uh, A.P. Gibbs wrote this one. That A.P. Gibbs was my mom's favorite speaker when she was a little girl uh, back in Chicago. And um, so even though 640 is the New Testament, we'll still sing the same tune to 639. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and so forth. Okay, Girl, Sunday school, we want you to really sing this out, kids. Here we go, ready? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, I think maybe that, that Sunday school version is a little different than the way the hymn had it. I was kind of trying to follow along. and Anyway, but the kids carried us, right? All right, well, welcome again to any visitors this morning uh, and tonight. We're privileged to have Dr. Steve Price with us, visiting from uh, Shawnee Assembly and, uh, and his wife Janet and, and his father-in-law Bob. So, privileged to have you here. Uh, again, be in prayer for all the children's ministries this week, uh, Brigade, TNT, and Awana on the Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then in prayer meeting um, and Bible study, we're in Joshua 2 right now. 
Um, next week, we'll have Sam Salazar in the morning, and then the Chapel Corporation meeting in the evening. So as many as possible can be there for that. Please, please, uh, please do come. So uh, as far as the assembly, we got 16 campsites this week just within our own assembly. Um, bear with us as we organize things a little bit. Uh, Rod would like to know if you got any campsites. If you haven't told him yet, be sure to do that. And then if you'd like to go, also see Rod. He wants to know what families or individuals, and uh, it's a little bit of a game to get everybody in the, in the places uh, such that everyone who would like to go can, can actually be there. Next Sunday evening, after the uh, evening meeting at 7 p.m., is going to be the chapel birthday celebration for February birthdays, actually for, uh, for January and February birthdays, so you don't want to miss that. Um, Easter luncheon is going to be March 31st at 12 noon. And then um, keep all the uh, conferences in your prayers, the Ladies' Missionary Conference on March 23rd, our spring conference here is May 17th through 19th. Yosemite conference is uh, July 14th through 20th. And then at the end of the year, Believer's Bible Conference, December 27th through 30th. All those speakers need prayer. They don't want to go up and speak in the flesh. They want to uh, allow their, we want all their preparation to be blessed and the messages to be uh, uh, meaningful uh, for each of us. So uh, keep all them in your prayers. Uh, VBS, we announced this just, just a little bit ago, but VBS this week, excuse me, this, this year, this summer, is going to be June 24th through 28th. It's the last full week of June. Uh, with any questions, please see Michelle. You can also talk to me, but uh, Michelle probably can more directly answer your questions for that. So, um, and again, Dave will be, still be taking uh, bicycles and games. Uh, what, what else? Any other items? Just bicycle and uh, kids' games. Kids' games, okay. Kids, Bi toys. kids toys, that's right. Okay. Um, so do... Do, do get in touch with him if you want to have him take anything up there to freedom. Uh, if there's no other announcements, I'll go ahead and we'll open this meeting in prayer. Heavenly Father, again, it's, uh, we humbly come into your presence. We, we invite your Holy Spirit here this morning, Lord, to not only touch our lives, but to, to give grace, to give words, and, and to bring, uh, bring forth your word through Steve as he shares it this morning for us. We thank you, God, for your son. We've remembered him this morning through the, the, the bread and the cup, and again, as we eagerly await his return. Father, we love you. We love your son. We thank you for the sacrifice he made. We thank you for the assembly we have and for one another. Please bless our fellowship, our time in the word right now. We lift up your holy, precious name through your son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our brother, Dr. Steve Price, is from Kansas City, so if he's up here with a little bit of a smile, you'd know why from last Sunday there. Super Bowl. Anyway. Number 491, 491, in shady, in shady green pastures so rich and so sweet, God leads his dear children along, along. And we'll sing verses 1, 3, and 4 of 491. Oh. 
hymn number 362. 362, eternity, time soon will end, and fleeting moments pass away. O sinner, say, where will thou will spend eternity's unchanging day, and so forth. Number 362. Good morning to you. It's a pleasure and privilege to be with you again, uh, but it's been a while. And so I was grateful when I got a text from Justin, and, and he basically put a gun to my head and said I should come out. So here I am, and this was a good weekend for us. So uh, there's just a, a few matters to mention just to keep ourselves uh, familiar. Um, uh, the Lord blessed us this last Christmas, and we have a new grandson. Also, the Weavers have a new grandson, and uh, his name is Wesley Scott. I was going for Wesley Steve. <laughs> I, I just want you to know that, okay? And you, you, you should be impressed at my self-control. No, just kidding. Uh, no, beautiful, beautiful grandson. I know they agree. And uh, then the Weavers came out just a few weeks ago, really, and so it was great to, to see them and to to be with Nick and Maggie. They send their hellos to you, and uh, they wish they could be here. So, so uh, uh, we are grateful to you for raising Nick up in this family. Um, let's begin by prayer, and then we'll get into what we need to talk about. Dear Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, and we thank you that of all the things that we have in this world to, to really value, to, to hold dear to our souls, it's your Son. And your son is this uh, splendid, most precious individual of all time. And we ask you to uh, uh, break open that he, like that day he served the, the bread, 
would break open the word of God for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we're going to uh, uh, hopefully add to a topic that you are currently involved in, and it is, of course, a discussion of the church. And uh, sometimes when you hear that, uh, some, some will go, oh, no, not again. And, uh, and others will go, fantastic. And others will say, we're doing a series on the church? All right. So, uh, so we'll, we'll try to kind of fit this in in the text of Ephesians chapter 2. And that'll be our text for this morning. In order to introduce this, I'd like to tell you a story that has to deal with my Gracie. Gracie's not here. She was going to be. And then um, I did something stupid. I forgot to buy the tickets, and so it didn't work out. But um, uh, Gracie was younger. She was uh, six or seven years old, and we were just starting to travel around. And, um, and when that happens, I, I might mention Gracie as an illustration because she's full of them. And uh, I was teaching and preaching, and I would talk about the little girl. She's the youngest one. You know, you got to talk about that, right? Don't you think? And so I was talking about her. And so everybody knew her, but never met her, right? So we go to like the Believer's Bible Conference, which you should all be there. I know you tried to be there last year, and Southwest had something to say about that. So you just go ahead and say something back and head on over to North Carolina. But anyway, uh, she, I think it was a Believer's Bible Conference, and everyone was coming up and says, oh, so you're Gracie, so you're Gracie. Gracie, she's getting a little freaked out by this, you know. How does everybody know my name, you know? And so we go back to the room one night, and we're just sitting there, we're kind of just chilling, and she says, are you ready? This is for the young people here. She goes, are we famous? <laughs> I said, no, but you are. <laughs> Now, when it comes to the discussion of the church, you should know something. You are famous. You see, in the mind of God, you are his, his masterpiece of sculpture. If you were to write uh, a, a symphony, your, your magnum opus, you, you, are, you are his masterpiece of all art, you are famous. Now, the idea is not to get caught up in how famous you are. The idea is to understand the value that God puts upon his church. That's what I want to discuss this morning. We will go through that topic and hopefully get some dimension and three-dimensional three development to the topic. And then tonight, we're going to focus on something that is a, a, a huge purpose of the church. And it's, it's, it, you would think it would be like evangelism or discipleship, but really, it's worship. It's our greatest calling, believe it or not. We don't think about it that often because most of our existence is spent either serving, you know, giving out or receiving, but we don't always think of putting Jesus Christ in his proper place. It's a natural outflow of this morning's discussion. So if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to begin and go through uh, several verses, but I'll do it in sort of a paragraph for, uh, format. Um, I'm going to first read verses 1 through 4, and we'll make commentary along the way. This paragraph, or excuse me, this section is titled, Where Did We Come From? Where did we come from? That's kind of important to know. If you're going to value what, what he's done for you and how he has made you, if, I, if you will, famous, you need to know where you came from. So let's read it together. And you were dead in your trespasses or transgressions and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, among whom we also formally conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as the rest. Now, I need you to look, uh, think with me for a few minutes about our condition. We want to appreciate where we came from. Never forget that. Now, when he begins this paragraph, he says it this way. You are actually dead. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, obviously not physically. You're sitting there looking at me, right? It can't be that. So he has to mean something else. And I think, of course, what he means is spiritually. 
Now, when he says that, he says, you're dead in your trespasses and your sins or in your, tra- your transgressions. He's saying that you have, when you, when you brought yourself to the table of reality, you already had crimes and misdemeanors, felonies and misdemeanors, which indicted you, convicted you, and sentenced you. That's how desperately strong the evidence was against you. There is no way out. The case is open and shut, means you go before the judge, he simply opens the books, sees the crimes, looks at you, the evidence is so prevalent, he closes the books, and you're sentenced. That's how steep, how deep the evidence was against us. And it says that's how you began. You began that way, you were born that way, you live that way. Now, that's not a very good way to start a message, isn't it? Guess what? You're lousy. That's kind of what he's saying. But he also says something else, but we'll get to that in a second. I want you to look in verse 1, or excuse me, verse 2, in which you formally walk. Now, the word walk is peripatao, which simply means this. I walk about, okay? I go about my life, and I live what the indictments actually call me out upon. Those statements, those uh, crimes, those lists of drongs, transgressions and sins, I actually did do them. And I did them under the influence of something else, of someone else. And this is hard for us to understand, but what has happened to the human race is very simple. When Adam and Eve agreed to follow Satan in his temptation, which was not a temptation, just a temptation to eat forbidden fruit, it was a temptation to act independently, if not rebelliously, against God. That's the real problem. And he says, when that happens, you inherited, are you ready? His spiritual DNA. There's a lot of press about DNA today. You can trace it back to who owns it. Well, guess what? Same thing with spiritual DNA. And you can trace back to who owns it. And in this case, when we resigned ourselves and signed over the title deed of the earth to Satan himself, what we did is he inoculated, he immunized us with his DNA. Thus, verse 2 says, we followed the course of this world, that was the domain Satan owned, according to the ruler of the power of the air. Who do you think that is? Well, it's not your political figures, it's Satan. It's a higher being, it's a higher power. And you belong to him, part and parcel, all of it, you were his. And look at this, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. In other words, not only did you, were you owned by Satan, but his dominion over you was by far and away the most prevalent thing in your life. That's how you're born into this world. You go, well, that's terrible, Steve. Why would you ever begin a message this way? If you're going to appreciate what you are, you better know where you came from. And that's exactly what he's doing here. Paul is a masterful, masterful at this kind of communication. Now, not only does he say that you have the spiritual DNA inoculated in you, that is, placed in your genetic makeup, you also showed it by the evidence of how you lived. He says in verse 3, we also formally conducted, that's the idea, we walked about, we showed the evidence of what was going on internally by how? By following our lusts. Now, this is a big word, lusts. We hear it all the time. If you do wordscapes, it shows up once in a while. And the idea of lust is a simple Greek word that means excessive desire. Now, think about it, okay? How many of you ever get hungry? Yeah, thank you, thank you. Nice, honest man you are, right? You're probably thinking right now, I could eat my arm. Don't eat your arm, okay? But the point is, is that you have natural, normal desires, don't you? Hunger, you know, uh, uh, pleasing to the eye, things you like to hear, and they're normal, and they're perfectly part of the human dimension. But when we signed ourselves over to satanic ownership, what happened then is that we took our normal uh, desires, which should be satisfied within the boundaries that God has given, and we excessively satisfied it. We took our satisfaction outside of those boundaries. Thus, we would have, you know, temptation to external marital affairs. We would go beyond the normal uh, boundaries that God has given for satisfaction. That's called lust. And in that lust, we demonstrated that we had the internal DNA of Satan that would want to 
rebel against God and go outside of the boundaries that he has set. Now, it turns out the boundaries that he has set for the human dimension and the frame of your emotions are perfect. They're already perfect. They don't need to be exploited or, or trampled. They're just good as they are. But Satan got Eve to think, excuse me, the boy, if you just had that other piece, it'd be better for you. You see how that works? We're called, what this is really called in theology is called the, the, the anthropology of man, how you got to what you are. And this is what we were before Jesus Christ. Now, some of us have hit it well over the years. We've clothed it with various morals. We've, we, we've covered it with various uh, uh, lies, even half-truths. And we've been able to present ourselves re- reasonably presentable to, to the general public. And you would look at each other and say, well, you're not so bad. You do pretty good. And yet we recognize that there is something that could be evil in a person. So you know what we do? We come up with theories like the yin and the yang. You know, it's there. It's good in you and there's bad in you. And we just, you know, the good can come out. We make movies about that. I know there's good in you, darling. Well, I have bad news for you. There's no good in you. There's none. Search for it as you may. It will always be tainted by sin. And Steve, if you're trying to encourage me, you're sure depressing me. Ah, the good news is yet to come. But you've got to face that fact. And in fact, when, when you come to Jesus Christ, that is a pivotal moment of epiphany where you have to recognize exactly what you are before a holy God, or else it doesn't make any sense. You're just buying better life insurance. But now what you're doing is you are recognizing the exact nature of where you came from and how desperately ill you were. You were on a raft, and the raft was banging itself down the river of destruction, And it was going to the great waterfall of death. And if you didn't get off that wrath, you would die in that manner. That's what this is. It's the rapids of self-destruction. Now we see it. When I was practicing medicine, I would see it a lot. People who came in, cutters, people who came in trying to hang themselves. And they were so emotionally worn out by all of this this confusion and, and guilt and conscience. And they just wanted to escape, and that was the solution. I have great news for you. That is not God's solution. So he changed us, right? Now let's read on. Verse 4. This is sort of the, um, uh, the, the sunshine that breaks across the dark skies. I want you to just, just, you read it, I'll quote it. Ready? But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, with which he loved us. Can't, don't, don't you just feel like the skies are going, Whoa! Eh? and there's, there's this mercy that comes beaming out like a ray of sunshine, and you go, well, where did that mercy come from? And you try to find the source and blinded by its glory, and you realize that it came from only one source, the love of God. Now, I need you to think with me for a minute. When we talk about mercy upon this planet, now let me say it this way. When I was just came back from Turkey, and I was in ancient Antioch. Ancient Antioch is the, the city mentioned in Acts, Acts 13 to be precise. And it was where Paul launched many of his missionary journeys. So I stood on the main street there, right? And I felt like I was Paul. No, I didn't. I felt like I was a tiny little mouse. But that's where Paul would preach, and and I could see the castle on the hillside, and that was devastated by the earthquake. 80 to 90, or 80% of the structures were either destroyed or they were um, condemned. Whole city blocks were just rubble. Some of those who lived there, the earthquake happened a year ago, February 6th. Um, It happened at 4 a.m. It was pitch black because the electricity was out. By the time the sun came up, 80% of the people on that block were dead. This was devastating. This was awful. And as a result, people had great, great sense of pity, a great sense of compassion. Just the tragic loss of human life was motivating to show mercy. But God has more than just pity. God has love. Not only does it it touch his heart by the human dimension, because it says so in Psalm 139, 
But in this text, you should know that God's mercy is motivated by an absolute passion for you. That's what it means, the love of God. A concern for you, not because you're crippled, not because you're in a bad way, but because he just simply loves you. That's it. That is the hardest thing for the human mind to understand, to comprehend that you love me. Don't you love me because? And the answer is, I don't love you because, I just love you. End of story, period, end of paragraph. That's what God is. His love is not attracted. uh, Something of you does not attract his love to you. That's how we think. His love will be there whether you're attracting it or not because God's love is self-moving. God's love is self-motivating. And in this case, the mercy of God reaches out of heaven and gives you something which you need, and that's a rescue from the raft that's the raft that's rushing towards the cliff of death in this journey through life. Isn't that nice? This is what we were. And what he did, look at verse 5, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, there was nothing lovely about us to attract his his rescue mission. There was no reason. It had to be totally self-initiated by God, and indeed it was and is. And that should just melt your heart to know that the God of the universe is not out of touch with your life. It's not disinterested. It's not too busy, but is all the more so interested, all the more so committed because he created you and he loves his creation. The world, Satan, wants you to think that God hates the human race, that God is, 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 is uh, homophobic or genocidal or in, uh, uh, and kills babies. That's, that's what the... The lie that Satan would want you to believe, but that is so opposite. You are rushing towards death and God steps in and spends his wealth to rescue you. It's done because he loves you. Now, here's what he says. While you're in that state, he made us alive. That's a tremendous thing. I, I have um, practiced medicine for 20, full-time for 26, 27 years. Over that period of time, I, I ran hundreds of code blues. Hundreds of them. I'll never forget one lady. She had, um, it's, uh, who's medical here? Her had torsades de points, okay? That's a lethal heart rhythm. And, it, and when you look at it on the monitor, it, it looks like a sine wave. You know, if you remember math, it's just up and down. Or, excuse me, it has a certain sort of configuration, like a sine wave. And uh, she, uh, she was almost 40, and she was on the cot, and I saw that, and you're immediately supposed to shock it, so I shocked her, and she woke up. I mean, within seconds, she woke up, and her heart rhythm was normal, and she said, what happened? And then suddenly, she went back into the lethal heart rhythm again, and I shocked her again. And I did that cycle 10, 20 times, an hour. I was giving her every drug known to mankind to try to break this lethal heart rhythm, and I was totally unsuccessful. The gravity of life and death to me was quite real. I cannot rescue from death. I I try, I work at it, I, 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 I train for it, but to be quite honest, I have a dismal success rate. But not with your God. Your God comes and you are dead in your trespasses and sins, and he makes you alive. He doesn't resuscitate you. He gives you new life. And that, my friends, is the power of God that rests upon you. And I tell you that illustration from the world of medicine for you to know, now that's someone you should respect. You got to know where you came from. Let's read on. It says that he raised us up with him. He entered into our place as a guilty sinner. He died in our place as if we were knit together with him. And he was buried into the grave as if we were buried with him. And he was raised out of the grave as if we were were raised with him. That's the teaching of the New Testament. That's the teaching of Romans 6 and 7. And he then, as he has new life, you have new life. And not only are you new life that you now can breathe again, he elevates you to the position position that he is elevated. In other words, you're not just given life and have to fend on your own. You don't have to sleep on the back 40 of the, of the ranch because he doesn't want to see you. He places you with him and the greatest seat of honor in heaven. Look at what it says. And raised up with him, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. 
And not only are you moved up to the highest echelon of honor and placement in Jesus Christ, from that moment on, you will have a sense of being uh, educated and served and, and, and even adored because you're with Jesus Christ. And look at what the next verse says. So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace, this whole idea of what he did when he made you from dead to life, you will learn about that in kindness. You will learn the dimensions of his motivation. You will learn the dimensions of the extent of his love. And it was mentioned this morning in prayer that really God's love cannot be measured and it is measureless if you even tried. That's what you'll learn. You see, you are the ultimate rags to riches story of the entire universe. No one can hold that kind of re resume except you who know Jesus Christ as Savior. And my friends, that is the church. So yes, you're famous in the eyes of God. Isn't that nice? <laughs> like Gracie, it should astound us. <laughs> she said, are we famous? Is this real? Yes, it's real. It's so real. Now we get to a paragraph that kind of becomes a bit of a summary statement. So we go, went from our condition to our summary. And I need you to look at this in verse 8. For by grace. Now notice the word grace was used in verse 5. All right? So and all the terminology is a description of grace. So what does that mean? You're in a condition in which you're helpless and dead. He comes along with nothing inviting about you, nothing attractive. So he, of his spontaneous desire, reaches into the jaws of death and pulls you out, not just to remove a dead corpse, but to give that dead corpse living life, right? Nothing motivated him except his own heart's desire for you. That's how precious you are. And so that's, that's the grace that he's discussed, talking about. For by grace are you saved through faith. You see that phrase, through faith? That word through faith means that you heard this story and you chose to make it your reality. I chose to make it my perspective of all of life. I believe that Jesus died on that cross for my sins and rose again, and I choose to, to orient my entire existence around that fact. I become a follower, therefore, of Jesus Christ. Now, many of us can come to the table of this discussion and have an understanding, even believe it. We know that's true. But you've not been a follower of Jesus. You've been a follower of yourself. My friends, that's not consistent, is it? If you, really, if you really believe it, you will do something about it. How many patients have I told over the years, you know, you need to quit smoking? Every one of them say, I know, Doc, I know. I said, have you quit? Oh, I'm down to, I'm down to one pack a day. Right? What does that mean? No, I haven't quit. That's what that means. Now, to know, to, to recognize the intellect that this is the truth is one thing. But to order your existence according to that truth, that's another thing. And that's where many of us fail. Maybe that's you today. You need to know where you come from. You need to know where you're going. And you need to know the God who's doing it. And here's what he says about you or about us. This is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. You see what faith is by this definition. It means that it does not, faith does not include something that you've added to it. So you believing on God is not something that he's rewarding you for. That's just your response. That's normal and natural. It's not something to be, uh, hang your hat on and say, I believed in you so you can, you can pay me back by saving my, me from my sins. No, 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 no. Saving of your sins was already paid for. You can't do anything to earn that. You just got to accept it, receive it. That's it. And that's where many a person stumbles. This is where you've come from. This is where you're going. And then he summarizes it in this way. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works. No works involved. Faith, therefore, is not a work, so that no one may boast. 
God has created the redemptive story where you can be born again without any evidence or, or platform to say, I earned it. No, you, you haven't earned it. You've been gifted it. That's what that means. Grace is, by definition, something you cannot stack up a sense of worthiness. It can't be earned. It is given. That's the kind of God that you have. This is the kind of God and how he thinks and how he go to, goes about his business and how he treats you. He gives you that. That's what makes it famous. Now, look at verse 9, the verse I mentioned to you at the beginning. For we are his workmanship. You know what that means? That means that we are his masterpiece. His, his sculpture of all sculptures. His, his uh, uh, carpentry of our carpentries. His Artwork of all artworks. We, he puts us in that category of the highest elevation of what he's doing with mankind. That will you will find will be the church. We'll find that in the next paragraph. And you need to know, you need to know where you came from to appreciate what, where you're going and what he's doing and what, he's, what identity he has now granted you in Jesus Christ. This is a special thing. This has got the fingerprints of the, of the master artiste of all artists. This is him, and you're his object, and he puts this value upon you. My friends, that's going to be called the church in about 10 minutes, and that's exactly what you need to know, how much value he places upon you as being his children. We forget that, don't we? And we sort of, sort of get involved with all of the difficulties that we have in the place called church. And we, lo- we lose our sense of value before the living God. And you should know that value never diminishes in front of the living God. He still considers you your master, his masterpiece. He still considers you the one that was created to do good works. Not to earn anything, but as a result of everything. And so he says it that way, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. Don't you love it when somebody has a plan? You know, I love it too. I I go to these conferences and and the guys that are organizing, they they say, all right, so Steve, you're going to do this, you're going to do this, you're going to do this, and then after that you do this, this, and this. And you know what? I go, praise God. I love being told what to do, contrary to what my wife may say. (laughs) Just kidding, dear, just kidding. Right? I love it when the man has a plan. Don't you like it? You don't have to think. I love that. God has a plan. And it wasn't one that he thought up on the fly. Well, I think if we, if we get it past the 30-yard line, we'll run, a, we'll run a pass play. No, he's not like making this stuff up. He's already got it figured out. How many more spectacular characteristics does God have to have for you and I not to go? You are awesome. This is what he's done. Prepared it beforehand. All right. Now, as we get into this, we're going to then move our focus from where we came from and his summary to what we are, and he's going to use terminology that describes the church. Now, in this description of the church that you will find, it's what we call the the 20,000-foot view, right? What do we mean by that? because I've never been at 20,000 feet. All right, here we go. There's this idea that everybody who's trusted in Jesus since Jesus rose from the grave way back in in 30 AD is part of this age that makes up the church. So people today, if you know Jesus Christ as Savior, you believed in him, there were people like that back in the first century like the author of this letter. He's part of the church and you're part of the church, although you're separated by over or nearly 2,000 years. You see, so you have this connection. You're under this big blanket. It's, a, it's the big picture. But what about this room? The Bible calls you the church. Like, for example, the church that's at Corinth. He could say the church at Claremont. Well, what you are is you're a smaller miniature of the big picture. Back in the day when we used to take school pictures, which I think guys like Scott and I would remember, 
you would go to school all dressed up, and they'd take your little photo, and then they'd give the parents this array of photos that their little guy took, and one of them was like the 8 by 10. And then, you know, mom and dad would put that on the piano. There's my son. Isn't he so good? But then we all carry around 30,000 little miniatures. Remember that? They're like this big. Do you, do you not remember this? Yeah, you did. I did. I did. My mother did that. She said, I want to see my son. And they'd all fall out of her purse. We are the miniatures. Okay? That's what we are. We are the microscopic version of the big picture. So we're going to look at the big picture so we can understand the microscopic version. Okay? Are you with me? Thank you, Jeff. I got a nod. And no derogatory remarks. This is good. This is good. All right, here we go. Therefore, remember, verse 11, that you are formerly the Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Now, that is a mouthful, all right? So I'll try to break it down. There is a surgical procedure that's done to the body that we don't need to go into the details of. Trust me, it's a surgical procedure. Today, it's usually done shortly after birth. But back then, it was a surgical procedure given to the children of Israel, that is Abraham's lineage, to sort of show they were a separate race ethnicity that God had designated to bring Jesus Christ into the world, right? To bring God through that lineage into the world. And so that mindset of the Jewish Judaism was that, hey, we're really special. We got the surgery to show it. Right? And so what happened is it became sort of a, a, a cloud, a badge of, of special privilege and honor. And anybody that wasn't of that group, they would say, well, you are uncircumcised. And it wasn't nice. It was like, uh, you dirty, rotten, uncircumcised person. Now, what Paul is saying is, that got switched around a little bit here when Jesus did what he did. And so although that group, the circumcision group, called you, the uncircumcision group, who you are, they use that terminology, you re and, and indeed, you are without Christ, look at verse 12, alienated from the citizenship of, of Israel and strangers. So alienated means you're actually a stranger. The word stranger means, let me just make sure I'm quoting this correctly. Yes, uh, alien means you're excluded. You're not allowed to participate, right? Stranger means you're unfamiliar and unacquainted. You are, are uh, lost in the zone. So when you're excluded, it's kind of like uh, not being allowed to go to the party, not being allowed to go to the club, not being allowed to participate. You are not a part of the Kansas City Chiefs football team. You can't come in here. I knew I could get that in there. I knew it, all right? But when it says you're a stranger, it's you're unfamiliar. So I've spent many times in foreign countries, and one of those was Russia. I was there for uh, probably a month, two weeks in the June and two weeks in September. And I remember that uh, when I was there, I was supposed to gr take a group of 10 down into the bowels of Moscow and their subway system, and we're supposed to go across the city and come up on the other side, hopefully not in a radiation-filled area. And so, you know what I did? I was really young and dumb. I go, yeah, I got this. Well, I don't know about you, but Russian letters are not like English letters. I, I learned, I found this out. And when you got on that little escalator, it, w it went down like six stories. You felt like you were going down to Shio, you know what I mean? That's what you felt like. And I got out there, all these guys, they're like from Tennessee. They talk like this, you know. And we're down there, and they go, Steve, are you know where we're going? And I go, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I look up, and I go, I'm totally lost. So I am madly comparing my little map with the letters on the wall and trying to figure out which train to jump on. You know what I was? I was unfamiliar and unacquainted, and when that happens, you are so lost. That's what our state was, and Paul is saying, listen, outside of, uh, outside of Christ, you were that way. The, uh, the, the religious people, the Judaizers, they knew that, and you knew that. You knew that too, and look at this. But now, verse 13, in Christ, you who are formerly afar off, that's us, we're Gentiles, have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, this phrase, brought near, is all over the Bible. God is always calling people to come near, 
Come near. In the Old Testament, he said it this way. You come near by a substitute's life being sacrificed for you, and then you can come near because your sins keep you away. And so what God was doing was he's saying, you'll need a, a human race will need a substitute to allow you to draw near, so I'm going to give you one, and it's Jesus Christ. And he became our substitute so we could draw near. And now we're drawn near. Remember, this is the whole language of it all, like an Old Testament language. You're away, you're separated, you're foreigners, you're alienated, you're alienated, and there's no way you can draw near, but now you can. Now you can through the Lord Jesus. He's brought you in because he paid a price that you could never pay. And no animal substitute of the Old Testament could ever pay that price. It had to be a perfect one, a perfect human. It had to be Jesus. And here you are. All right, look at this. For he himself is our peace, ooh, peace, who made both groups one and broke down the middle wall of partition. All right, that's a big phrase. What does that mean? That means this, that there was this thing called the law. This is from Colossians. And this law could list out your crimes and misdemeanors. It could actually list what you've done wrong. The Ten Commandments, you know, people use that. And they say, well, have you ever committed adultery? And you say, well, no. Well, did you ever look at a woman to lust after? Well, yeah. Well, Jesus said that's adultery, so you're, you know, 0 for 1, you know. And uh, did you ever lie? Well, no. Except that one time when it was convenient and it didn't hurt anybody. Okay, you're 0 for 2. Okay. Well, did you steal? No. Well, except for that one time when I kind of borrowed the, uh, uh, the little coffee thing from work and I accidentally took it home and I, I, I just kept it. Like, yeah, that's called stealing, you know. Did you ever lie? Yeah, you did. You see, the, the law, it, it sets us up, right? It identifies exactly where we're wrong and exactly what kind of criminals we are. And the Bible says it this way. You don't have to break all ten to be a lawbreaker. You just have to break one. It only takes one pin to pop the balloon, doesn't it? And that's what he said is dividing us. The Judaizers are over there, you non-Judaizers, you Gentiles over here. This big mountain of crimes that have been codified for us to see is right between us. And what did Jesus do? He bore a hole through that wall. He took it out. And instead of having two groups, are you ready? This is the church now. He made you to become one group. One group forever to take that which was Jewish and that which was Gentile and bring it together. And this made everybody in Paul's day, his Jewish folks, made them mad as hornets. But this was the plan that God had in mind. He was the man with the plan. Now look at this. It says, but now Jesus, who was formerly far off, brought you near by the blood of Christ, made peace, both groups into one, took care of the dividing wall. In the book of Colossians, it says it took that wall like it was a document, and it was nailed to the cross where Jesus hung. Where he, you, you, In those days, when a, Ro, when a person was con, uh, crucified by the Romans, they put above them their crimes that they're being punished for. In Jesus' day, they put above his head the sign that said, the king of the Jews. That was no crime. That was a statement of fact. But the real crimes were the ones that was that handwriting of document that was against me, the law, the separating partition. That was nailed to the cross too. Most people didn't see it except the eyes of God. Those were your crimes. Now listen, look at the next verse. Abolishing in his flesh the enmity of the law of commands. They didn't make it up. The law of commandments. There was a, there was a, a, a nasty enemy-like condition where the law was attacking you and wanting to knife you through because you were convicted by its statements and the penalty was death. It wasn't like jail time. And so he said, so that in himself he might create into two or into one the new man. You see what he did? He took the most opposing parts of the of ethnicities, and through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, he brought you together to be one new entity. Now, I need to say this so that if you're confused, um, I need to, to make sure it's clear. It's not a redo of Israel, okay? It's not a replacement of Israel. If you're familiar with those terms and you would understand I am not saying that we get all the promises that were made to Israel to the church. It's new. Brand spanking new. So are you famous? Yes, you are. You are brand new. Brand new. Now, I know what you're going to say. 
You say, well, I don't feel very brand new. And if you look at that brother over there, he doesn't look very brand new to me. And that's probably true. But you see, the blood of Jesus Christ washes all your sins away. Now, clearly, we're not supposed to continue to live in a manner that's inconsistent with the nature of Jesus Christ. And if that brother is doing that, then the Lord will deal with him. And believe me, God is great at disciplining kids. But I tell you, you are new because of the blood of Jesus. You know, that's what makes us so unique, right? That's why I can come from Kansas and come over here and, and be with you because we believe in the same truth and, and we are part of that one newness. Now look at how he describes it. Verse 18, verse 16, that he might reconcile them both in one body. So the metaphor of the body comes up. Now the word reconcile needs to be discussed first. Reconcile is more than just um, I didn't know you and you didn't know me, so we weren't really fighting, but we just we weren't friends. That's one type of reconciliation. Would you agree? I don't even know your name, but that's the idea, right? Now, if we were fighting, if we were mad at each other, and we turned our backs when we walked in the room together, now reconciling that is harder, isn't it? We've got a barrier to overcome. That's this word, reconcile. He takes away the enmity between us, not just the stranger. He does both, doesn't he? It's really, it's really fascinating. Now, what about this body thing? All right, he makes this, so we use this idea, one new man, he then switches it over to body, and this is what he says. He says, you are a, a conglomerate of organized flesh and bones, of tissue that has synchrony and harmony, grace and elegance. Now, you've got to think about this. I'm going to use my daughter Maggie because you know her uh, uh, because she's Nick's wife. Maggie um, was a gymnast for 10 years, and uh, I love to watch her sport. You know, I'm, I mean, I'm not a big gymnast fan, but when she was in, I was a huge gymnast, gymnastics fan, right? And I would watch her body in motion, just like, like, like gliding in air, moving. She's parallel to the ground, coming off the uneven bars, parallel to the ground, and flipping around and not, not missing a stroke. You know, you got to admit, that's kind of, it's like watching ice skating. How do I guys do that, you know? And, they, and, and she's that kind of fluidity of motion. Her body is totally under control. Now that's the idea of this. He makes us two opposing ethnicities, the ultimate and solving discrimination issues. He brings us together to be a new entity, a new dimension, a new humanity, and he unites us not as splintered groups, but as one body that works in harmony and elegance and absolute beauty. And that's what it is. That's the church. That's the big picture, and that's our little miniature, isn't it? Now, let, read on. And he came and preached the good news to, of peace to those who were, far, who were far away. That would be the Gentile group. And to those who were near, that would be the Judaizers who were already given the law and, the, and Moses and the commandments. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. That work of Christ brings us together so that through the spirit of God, we can now approach the Father without hesitation. That, that curtain has been ripped, the barrier is gone, and we have full access to God. We don't have to go through another person. We don't have to recite some sort of unique incantation to open the, unlock the doors of heaven. We have access to the Father and you do too, as soon as you say, my Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. You're there. You are a famous group. And it's his church and he loves you with all the passion that was expressed at the cross. And he loves you now as he loved you then. And he's given you an identity that should change your existence. He calls you a new man. He calls you a body. Look at what else what he says. He says, verse 19, no longer strangers and sojourners. Same terminology just a paragraph ago. But you are fellow citizens. Fellow citizens. Recently, we had the war break out in last October 7th in Israel. At that time... We had, a fan, we had a couple with us, George and Raz Khalil. They were residents, they are residents in Nazareth. They're Palestinian, or he's Palestinian, she's from the UK, but they're Israeli citizens. As soon as that war broke out, they said to me, 
we got to get home. We got to get home. Their loyalty was to their country. There was a sense of belonging. There was a sense of need and desperate uh, 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 occasion to meet that need. My friends, you have a citizenship. And it's not the one that you see being exploited and, and turned upside down in the United States. It's a citizenship that unites you with the heavenly territory of the country of God. That's what this is. That's the church. Do you see it? It's absolutely magnificent. This is God dreaming this up before it all happened. Now look at what it says. It's fellow citizens with the saints who are God's household. Do you know what that means? That you are God's place of living. That you are the place where God chooses to dwell. And we'll find out hopefully this summer exactly what that means. That you not only are bricks and mortar, you are the servants within the, in the dwelling place. That's how God thinks. And he calls all of that his church. And he says it this way. In whom the whole building being joined together is growing into a holy sanctuary of the Lord. Where did God dwell in the Old Testament? He dwelt in the temple. He dwelt in the tabernacle and then the temple. And now in the New Testament, he uses the same metaphorical language. And he says, you people, you are the church and you're like a temple to me. This is where I dwell. There is no other place on the planet I want to dwell. There is no other place I will dwell. I will dwell in the temple of my people. They are like the bricks and mortar, the stones on the wall, and they are like the attendants, the priests and priestesses who care for the things of God. And that's what you are. You are this magnificent masterpiece that requires incredible, precise provision to bring it about and to maintain it and to sustain it and that's your savior that's what you are you are famous yes he says it this way ends that you are being built together into a dwelling place of god in the spirit wow that's impressive now, I'm out of time, so I'm going to stop here. And if you'd like to hear the rest of the story, it'll be tonight. And we're going to go to our purpose, and then I'm going to show you how worship works into that purpose, okay? I hope that gives you a foundation and a footing, and may you just rejoice in the new identity God has given you. God has given you an identity that no one else has except you. That's why you should hurt for the lost hurt for those who haven't received Christ as Savior. For believe me, they're searching for an identity that cannot be satisfied unless they know Christ. Let's thank him now. Father, we thank you for the word of God that has come forth to us from the hand and the, and the sweat and tears of the Apostle Paul. He was a designated person to communicate all of this to us. And he did it well, and we thank you that you guided him in this way. But Father, the same spirit that guided him to pen these words is the same spirit that will need to illuminate our souls and gravitate us to the grandness of these things that you have done, that you have planned, that you have executed, that you have uh, 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 accomplished and sustained by your amazing power. And we are grateful to you for this, Father. We are thankful to you. This is not some sort of uh, mass... Uh, uh, um, uh, 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 mind game. This is, this, is, this is you doing what you do. You're resetting the compass of reality for us, and we thank you for it, that you made us a masterpiece, and you're making us into this thing called the church. You're called out ones that have a unique identity above all others. Thank you, O oh Father. Thank you, O oh Savior. Please let your spirit continue to teach us long after we say,